coming up on Network Africa. Togo postpones its parliamentary and regional elections amid tensions on the new constitution. Embattled South African Parliament Speaker charged with 12 counts of corruption resigns hands herself over to the police. Plus, Zimbabwe's President Emerson Nagangwa declares national disaster over drought. Welcome to the program. I'm Joker Rogers. We begin in West Africa, where Togo has delayed parliamentary and regional elections amid tensions following controversial constitutional reform. The presidency announced the postponement of the elections on Wednesday, but has not given a new date for the polls, which were initially due to be held on the 20th of April. The reform approved by lawmakers last week replaced the presidential system with a parliamentary one. It also hands executive power to the prime minister, reducing the presidency to a symbolic role. Opposition parties have rejected the reform, fearing it could let President uh, for Yasingbe stay in power. He succeeded his father, who died in 2005 after ruling the country with an iron fist for 38 years. The Conference of Togolese Catholic Bishops has urged President Nyasingbe not to sign the constitutional changes into law, citing the need for broad consultation and a more inclusive national debate. Over in South Africa, in battle, Parliament Speaker Nosiviwe Napisa Nkakula has resigned and relinquished her seat in the legislature over allegations of corruption. Now former National Assembly Speaker, she has been charged with 12 counts of corruption and one count of money laundering. She made her first court appearance on Thursday morning after handing herself over to officers at the Littleton Police Station in Centurion, Pretoria. Her reason for resigning, she says, is her wish to safeguard the integrity of Parliament. This comes amid corruption allegations against Mapisa Ngakula when she was Defence Minister. Uh, she was appointed as a speaker in 2021. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, has more details in this report. Nosivi Wemapisa Ngakula says her immediate resignation as National Assembly Speaker and Member of Parliament is not an admission of guilt. Mabisa Ngakula has been under mounting pressure from opposition parties to resign or face a motion of no confidence. This is the culmination of the report I tabled in 2021 uh, in Parliament to the Joint Standing Committee on Defence, wherein I briefed the committee or wrote to the committee to tell them that uh, <clears throat> the then Minister of Defence, uh, Minister Mapisa Ngagula, uh, is alleged to have uh, extorted one of the service providers of the Defence Force. We therefore uh, look forward to her appearing in court. Um, of course, we welcome the resignation of Ms. Mapisa Ngagula. We have, uh, as you said, long called for her resignation because we were always of the view that uh, somebody who holds si such a high office, such as the Speaker of the National Assembly, should not be facing allegations of this serious nature. And so we, uh, we had hoped that she would have resigned a lot earlier in order to really, you know, retain the, um, or at least, you know, try to uphold the, the reputation of the institution of parliament because as lawmakers we are entrusted with holding the executive to account but when one of our own is accused of such of money laundering and, uh, and, and, and corruption then you know we should be able to be beyond reproach. The 67-year-old made her first appearance at the Pretoria Magistrate Court on Thursday morning. But where does her resignation put the ANC? Basically, you know, 
it adds to the problem that the ANC has had of appointing persons of credit, uh, dubious morality, uh, uh, people who have no proper ethics, people of questionable backgrounds to high office. The office of the presidency was tainted by Jacob Zuma in terms of criminal activities. Now the office of the speaker is tainted. Uh, and only the only office remaining now is that of the Chief Justice. Mabisa Ngakula says she remains a dedicated member of the African National Congress. Meanwhile, the ANC spokesperson Matlengu Bengu Motsiri says the party values Mabisa Ngakula's commitment to maintaining the image of the party. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television. Staying in South Africa, footballer Luke Fleurs has been shot dead in a car hijacking situation. Police say the shooting took place at a petrol station on Wednesday night in the Johannesburg suburb of Florida. One of the suspects is reported to have fled the scene with Fleurs' car after the shooting. KZR Chiefs, one of the most popular clubs in the country and a 12-time league champions, describe his death as tragic. South Africa is grappling with increasing gun violence with several mass shootings reported in recent years. The country has one of the world's highest murder rates, according to police data. Let's get more on this from our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa. Innocent, uh, great to see you today. Uh, yet another gun crime we're discussing. What more information do we have from the authorities on this latest incident? Well, a very good evening to you, colleague, and our viewers around the world. Indeed, unfortunate news coming through from last night. Um, one of the biggest team in South Africa, Kaiser Chiefs defender Luke Flair, was gunned down in Johannesburg. According to the South African Police Services, um, it was a hijacking incident uh, that took place in Hanijou. This is towards the north of Johannesburg, around 8.30 in the evening. Uh, but also we do know that the police are looking out for suspects. We're told that um, he was shot and killed before they hijacked his vehicle. Uh, it's reported also that he was driving a VW Golf Golf 8 GTI, which is one of the high-risk vehicles in South Africa. Um, if you pay insurance for that particular car, um, you will pay um, a lot of money because it's a um, high-risk vehicle in South Africa. A VW, uh, a Polo VW is actually one of the cars that are ex actually expensive to uh, insure. Apparently, the incident took place in a petrol station uh, while he was uh, waiting to be served by a petrol attendant, uh, we're told that a white BMW approached and um, they then shot him in the in the upper body. They shot him once in the upper body and then two guys came out of the, the white BMW and um, they took him out. They uh, followed each other uh, with the two cars and they fled the scene. Uh, we're told by the police also that uh, he was declared uh, dead when he arrived at the nearest hospital uh, right there in Haneju, colleague. And what exactly is the government doing to tackle, you know, the menace of crime in South Africa, which, you know, according to uh, some reports, has, uh, you know, one of the highest rates in the world. Says her immediate well, resignation opened a case of murder and car hijacking. For investigation, no arrests have been made, as I've indicated earlier. Uh, but uh, we're told that uh, there's a team of... Uh, uh, seasoned detectives from the provincial office, uh, that is the South African Police Services Provincial Office, to investigate and search for the suspects. Uh, police are also calling for anyone with information to come forward. Again, the challenge of police being incapacitated come to the fore. Um, I think what we're seeing right now, it's a challenge, a long-standing challenge, a long-standing issue that needs a, a lot of attention from government. Uh, but we know that there is a fleet of uh, police that have been trained at the moment to really 
and try to capacitate the police because the crime issue is really getting out of control in the country. Uh, but uh, we've not heard uh, as to when they will actually deploy um, you know, the fleet to actually come and, 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 and help with the issues of crime. Uh, I, I guess the issues of crime in our communities, they happen because there's less police visibility and you can blame them because at times the police are really incapacitated. They're short-staffed. So that's the challenge that we're facing. But I guess it's something that um, it's a wake-up call for the government to uh, essentially uh, look for more police visibility in our communities, colleague. We do apologize for the initial mix-up in the first visual there showing the uh, trial of a former speaker of the South Africa Parliament and, of course, uh, innocent reporting about the footballer's death. But we move on now to Zimbabwe. Uh, President Emerson Ngangwa has declared a national disaster to tackle the prolonged drought crisis. Mr Ngangwa says the country needs $2 billion to tackle hunger caused by low rainfall, which has wiped out about half of the maize crop. The grain shortage has pushed up food prices and an estimated 2.7 million people may face hunger. Neighboring Zambia and Malawi have also recently declared the states of disasters due to drought as well. Some fear that the drought sweeping southern Africa will be one of the worst in decades. Let's get more on this. Zimbabwean journalist Nigel Yamumbutu joins us now. Hello, Nigel. Great to see you today. <clears throat> yes, and uh, a pleasant viewing to the uh, listeners and viewers. Right. And so the $2 billion to tackle hunger, that's what the president says is needed. How does the government intend to get this done? Yes, um, well, um, President Munangaba's statement yesterday is essentially a um, cry out for help. It's essentially him extending a begging bow to um, all and sundry uh, in the grim reality that uh, uh, the people are facing starvation um, and the threats of this drought are indeed real. So essentially, uh, the president is looking at the United Nations, uh, whether through uh, its programs like the World Food Program uh, or through other uh, of its agencies, uh, the donor community, uh, the churches, uh, the Zimbabweans in the in the diaspora, uh, basically it's a, it's it's a, it's a rallying call uh, for assistance. It's an admission uh, that as a Zimbabwean government, uh, they would not be able to uh, feed. Uh, you know, the people with the current uh, harvest, they will not be able to respond to the need uh, of um, the citizenry and would therefore uh, require help. Uh, of course, uh, part of declaring a state of disaster is to also uh, indicate that uh, government will reprioritize, the, it uh, permits uh, essentially, the government to uh, even reallocate resources. Otherwise, that would have been budgeted for other things. Uh, but to galvanize whatever uh, is within the coffers uh, to try and alleviate the uh, real crisis that is imminent as a result uh, of uh, this El Nino drought, um, uh, El Nino induced drought. And help us understand how bad the situation is and what it means to, you know, it, for it to be declared a national disaster. It is a national disaster. Uh, by any uh, figment of imagination, it, it uh, really uh, tells you of the depth uh, of the crisis. Never mind that the country is already really uh, from an economic uh, crisis of its own, uh, hyperinflation, 
uh, which uh, is making the prices of uh, basic goods, uh, commodities and services beyond uh, the reach of many. And uh, uh, what uh, is really uh, a surprise uh, is this uh, admission by government that the country requires help. Uh, what had been obtaining uh, in the December period, uh, in fact, when the agricultural season starts, uh, um, there was this uh, propaganda, if you like, that uh, we've got enough reserves. Uh, there was this notion uh, that we are expecting uh, normal uh, harvest and, and that uh, we are essentially out of danger. But for the president to then come out and affirm and confirm what uh, the uh, world uh, had been telling Zimbabwe, uh, what uh, the region, uh, Zambia, for example, has long predicted that this is a disaster, this needs uh, urgent intervention. Uh, Zimbabwe we have rather responded reactively when the crisis um, is, is a bit deeper now, and when indeed 2.7 million people face starvation, that is a, 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 a serious humanitarian crisis in our hands. Uh, are there temporary solutions in the works? We do know that the president is, you know, calling to anyone that can help at all. But within the country, are there, is there anything the government is hoping to do to remedy the situation only if, you know, partially? Well, yeah, I think by by uh, declaring a state of disaster, that's one step because that then opens uh, for uh, latitude for the government to implement or to reallocate uh, resources. That would also uh, open up the avenues for the, 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 the government to not only extend a bag and bow, but uh, perhaps to uh, borrow outside the long routes uh, of going through parliament. Uh, it also uh, entails uh, that uh, uh, the, the crisis it topples the agenda to the extent that um, those that require food aid uh, will already be, be identified. There will already be uh, some packages that will be provided to ensure that the skyrocketing prices of grains uh, can actually be reduced. Uh, it opens uh, that legal uh, channel also uh, for for government to, to implement, say, you know, price controls and other such measures uh, to alleviate the disaster. So it is indeed a start uh, of this temporal measure, but there is indeed need of $2 billion, as, uh, as was said, and uh, uh, perhaps a more elaborate uh, climate change policy and response plan to crisis of this nature. A pleasure having you on the program today. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts on that. Welcome back to the program. An 80-year-old U.S. woman has been killed by an aggressive elephant after it charged at a vehicle during a safari drive in Zambia. Local officials say the attack happened over the weekend in Kafue National Park in the west of the country. In a video circulating online, the large elephant could be seen flipping the car, carrying six people over several times. Keith Vincent, CEO of the Safari Group, said the vehicle was blocked by the terrain and couldn't move out. The eight-year-old woman, who has not been named, died of her injuries. Officials said her remains will be repatriated to the United States in the coming days. Four other guests sustained minor injuries and are receiving trauma counseling. One woman was taken to a hospital in South Africa for treatment. And more from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Locals have been reacting to the appointment of Judith Toluca Sumimwa as the DRC's first female prime minister. Residents have expressed a range of views regarding her new role. Some hope that her leadership 
would address the pressing security situation in the country, particularly in the conflict-ridden East. Other highlights the specific challenges faced by women in the conflict zones, hoping that the new PM would prioritize addressing the plight of women in the eastern region. What I expect from this lady is to look into the security situation in the east of the country, particularly in the Beni region, where women are the most affected. We, the people of Beni, we need peace. We earn a living from agriculture, but because we do not have peace, there is no way to cultivate on our farms. I would like the new Prime Minister to deploy the military throughout the country in order to guarantee peace. Since the expanded program on immunization launched in Nigeria in 1976, more vaccines have been added to eradicate killer diseases in the country. Sadly, the enthusiasm to tackle diseases has not been matched with vaccine and treatment uptake. This is the problem the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research, with help from partners, wants to tackle in, designate, in Designathon 2024, a program where young minds find ways to improve health-seeking habits. Our correspondent, Mary Alale Yusuf, reports. The health community is concerned about the progression of HIV, hypertension, cervical and liver cancer, among other diseases, in the face of cheap and sometimes free preventive intervention. That's why Naima has convened this conference with young people between the ages of 19 and 24 to come up with solutions. Participants were selected from over a thousand entries to come up with the 40 teams represented here. So how can we make this better? So we the conveners give further clarification about their collaboration with young people at a press conference. Getting them to buy in, getting them to bring the solution to us, we make the results acceptable to them, and therefore the impact that it will have on the targeted disease will be strong. You know, we are here asking our youth asking our community-based organizations, asking just everybody that has you know, a handle on health, that has experienced health, that wants to learn to bring those solutions and together we will co-create what we know would work best for us. It's not the first time Naima will seek ideas from the younger generation. It did so when the country needed to find a solution for people who wouldn't report for HIV tests. They told us this is best strategy. If you want young people who ordinarily would not come to hospital to do HIV self testing, HIV test, but if you have the one they can do in the comfort of their home, they were able to do that. And with that, we're able to ramp up the HIV testing. And that have translated to policy. Participants are excited to be a part of National Health Solutions. It is a great opportunity to listen to other like-minded people who are really looking at ways to like innovate the healthcare facility, to improve the healthcare facility. Being in Ibadan and having our projects done in Ibadan, it would ensure that it will not affect our schooling and we will be able to like actualize, do something important for our health sphere in Nigeria. In the next few days, 40 groups of volunteers will be whittled down to five. The final selection will be back for boot camp in June, when they are to be schooled in the ethics of research, as well as pitching strategies. Mary Alale Yusuf, Channels Television News. Well, moving on now, the 16 United Nations police officers from Bhutan serving with the mission in South Sudan on this have received the prestigious United Nations Medal for their contributions to building a brighter future for the citizens of the world's youngest nation. In a medal pinning ceremony in Juba, the UNMIS Deputy Police Commissioner Kausto Sharma says medal received is a testament of sacrifices and hard work made in these difficult conditions. According to the mission, ensuring to deliver on mandated tasks, the dedicated 
Bhutanese contingent kept up a high standards of operational readiness through community-led policing initiatives, capacity building for local policing counterparts, technical advice and assistance, training and patrolling. We are anticipating elections this year. The protection of civilians, providing electoral support, strengthening of the rule of law, and rolling out robust capacity building programs for National Police Service remain our core priority to ensure peaceful electoral process. Each medal you receive today is testament of your sacrifices and hard work in these difficult conditions in South Sudan. I am proudly um, happy or um, uh, overjoyed to wear this medal. However, this medal is not a uh, mere adornment, but it represents the uh, trust bestowed upon us by our host country and all the people who are in need. So uh, this is our testament as our uh, unwavering support, unwavering uh, commitment to maintaining peace and security uh, throughout the world. Let us strive to build bridges of understanding, cultivate trust, and promote harmony among all the communities. Please let us be reminded that the medal we receive today is the result of our sacrifices and hard work in this harsh environment, as well as the sacrifices of our loved ones back home. Well, that's our program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jackie Rogers.